Well, hello everyone and welcome to this uh, third session in our virtual forum this year. Um, my name is Ben Rice, I'm the Executive Officer of the Australian Digital Alliance uh, and I'd like to begin today by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people who are the traditional owners of the land here uh, in Canberra uh, where I'm joining you from today. Uh, on behalf of the ADA I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and uh, emerging. So thank you very much for joining uh, this session where we're talking about the case for a digital lending right. Uh, I am joined by uh, today by Olivia Lanchester, who's the CEO of the Australian Society of Authors, Trish Hepworth, the Director of Policy and Education uh, at ALIA, and Kirsty Murray, an author and a board uh, director at the ASA as well. Um, I won't do too much of a, an introductory spiel because the people joining us know far more about um, uh, the case for digital lending rights uh, than I do. So I might hand straight over to Trish, who is going to um, get us started with an overview of the, the case for a digital lending right. Trish, if you're there, I'm not sure if you can hear us, but I can't hear you just yet. Excellent. Now oh, I'm are. unmuted. Hello, everybody. Uh, apologies for the complete technical incompetence. Uh, I'm calling in again today, similar, exactly the same as Ben from the lands of the Ngunnawal and the Gambri people. And I'd like to extend my respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us today. I'm going to just do a very quick scene setting for lending rights. Lending rights are one of the, frankly, the best things we've got in cultural policy in Australia, in my humble opinion. But they're also one that there's not a huge amount known about. To sort of set a scene for lending rights, lending rights revolve around libraries. So we've got about 9,600 public libraries across the country that have about 9 million members. Those members make about 111 million visits every single year in physical and about 50 million virtual uh, visits each year. We also have a whole lot of school libraries. So we've got about 9,500 school libraries across the country. So we have libraries that touch and reach into almost every, well, into the, every community in Australia and most families in the country. We have two lending rights schemes, public lending right and educational lending right. And both these lending rights schemes basically make a payment to eligible Australian authors and eligible Australian publishers in recognition of the giant community benefit that we derive from the fact that these authors have their, their books in public libraries and their books in school libraries that can be enjoyed by children and borrowed and taken home and read in story times and that adults can come in and read in the library and read at home. Um, in recognition of that huge value, we have a scheme where a payment is made to, as I said, to eligible authors and publishers. Public lending rights started in 1976. So it's been going for an incredibly long time and it was joined in the 2000s by educational lending right. Unsurprisingly, public lending right covers public libraries, educational lending right covers school libraries, uh, TAFE libraries and university libraries. A couple of quick things about the way that these rights are, are administered. So this is a government scheme. So we thank the federal government very much for giving us the $22 million or so each year that goes into these lending rights. And in the last, uh, year that we've got information for about 17,200 payments were made. We calculate these payments on holding. So what happens each year is there is a survey done of public libraries and a survey done of educational libraries. And from that, we work out how many different books are held by each of those libraries. And then we put it all into a giant pot, calculate the, the numbers and dole out the money to the eligible creators. 
I feel a bit of a fraud turning up to a copyright forum talking about lending right. One of the most important things about lending right is that it's not a copyright based scheme at all. However, because of the role that it does and the where it sits adjacent to supporting the cultural scheme, we thought it was relevant enough to bring to you today. One of the things about the fact that it's not a copyright scheme, it means that we can control that eligibility criteria. And so that's why it is only for Australian creators. Um, Every year we get a whole number of books. So we get about an extra 4,000 books go on to our lists every single year. And that's a recognition of the huge creativity in the Australian literary sector. And in fact, we know that library users love Australian content. So about 60% of the top 10 loans, well, the top 20 loans in libraries are actually Australian content. For authors, what they have to do is go online, they can register through the government portal, and once a year that payment is made to them based on how many of their books are in public libraries. This year, of course, things were a little bit different. Well, last year in particular, when COVID hit, the libraries shut down. And you might think that what we saw then was a halt to people borrowing books. But that wasn't the case. Actually, what we saw was people continued to be engaged with their school libraries and people continue to be engaged with their public libraries. Uh, some examples, figures in New South Wales, we suddenly saw a 300% uptick in borrowing of digital items. So people accessing ebooks and audio books from home. In almost every state and territory, library memberships went up as people picked up their library membership in order to access electronic materials. Which brings us to the whole point of this panel. So we have these great lending rights schemes, public lending right and electronic and educational lending right. But what they don't cover is ebooks or audio books. And in a time when COVID has, where we can see the impact that COVID has had in shutting down access to physical copies. And we've seen the huge responsiveness of the library services in delivering electronic materials to people. That's probably a gap that we need to address sooner rather than later. Thanks so much for that um, overview, Trish. I should say to everyone as well, please do feel free to ask any questions in the comment box there uh, in the chat box. You can also use the, the Q&A function or if you click the little raise hand icon, uh, I, I can prompt you to, um, to turn on uh, your microphone and, and ask a question of the, the panel directly that way as well. Um, so I might hand over now to Olivia, CEO of the Australian Society of Authors. Um, to give us uh, a bit of perspective from the ASA. Thank you, Ben. Um, I'm speaking to you all today from Gadigal land. I acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to Elders past and present. Um, maybe just to flesh out a little from Trisha's beginning, um, I want to talk to you firstly about the policy intent behind the PLR and ELR schemes. Because often when I talk about um, the ASA's campaign when it comes to digital lending rights, I'm often asked, well, why does it matter? Authors get paid, they get paid. When libraries acquire eBooks, they're paid. What's the issue? Um, so just to give a simple explanation, when a library, let's look at the print world and what happens currently. When a library acquires a print book, yes, the library purchases the book from the publisher. The publisher is paid for that book and the author receives a royalty. But then that book sits in the library and is borrowed again and again and again. And as Trish says, it's wonderful that books are accessible to members of the community and to students through university and TAFE and school libraries. But the government has long recognised that that multiple use of that particular work 
it represents to some extent royalties foregone from the creator because the creator is paid the initial royalty on the initial purchase of that library book um, and then that's it and so that was the policy intent behind the introduction of PLR and also ELR the recognition that it's wonderful we have community access to books, but creators must be um, also paid. Now, the ASA has a very long history when it comes to PLR and ELR. We campaigned for the introduction of PLR in 1975 and ELR in 2000. And now we are campaigning again for the modernization of the scheme. So as Trish said, it doesn't apply to the digital world not to ebooks or to uh, audio books. And that's what the ASA has been asking the government um, for over five years now to expand the eligibility uh, criteria. In a nutshell, we think that it should not matter in what format a library holds a book, ebook format, audio book format, print format should make no difference. And the reason is that that is the way to future proof the schemes. Um, Trish spoke about the spike in ebook borrowing last year uh, with COVID. I think that that trend is likely set to stay. And we know as well from hearing from libraries that they are expanding their digital collections, their ebook collections. So, in order for the PLR and ELR schemes to remain relevant um, and contemporary, we need to modernise the criteria. Last year, the ASA conducted a survey of our members. And unsurprisingly, uh, they told us that the PLR and ELR systems are beloved. And I'm going to leave it to Kirsty to talk to you from an author perspective about the importance of PLR and ELR. Uh, but we also had 99% of respondents in favour of an expansion of the PLR and ELR schemes to cover digital formats. So there is just overwhelming support from the author community for this change. Um, lastly, I wanted to raise today uh, just the broader issue of author earnings. And that's important because it provides the necessary context for our campaign. I know that we don't have time to go into um, all of the reasons why authors are finding it hard to make a living, but I do think it's very relevant to just touch on um, the current circumstances for Australian authors and Australian literature. Whilst last year ended up being a great year with a very strong Christmas, author incomes have been declining now for um, a couple of decades. The Macquarie University research back in 2015, a lot of people are already familiar with. It showed that the average income for authors from their creative practices was $12,990. And um, our own survey last year backed that up by showing a similarly grim scheme. We had 80% of respondents reporting income below $15,000 for their creative practices. So the picture for Australian authors, um, to give that context, just a few things. Australian authors and publishers compete in a global market. Consumers can buy books from international retailers all around the world. That does put pressure on book prices which haven't increased for years and which are unlikely to do so. So author royalties are flat. Um, we know that advances have been declining over many years. And in fact, smaller publishers today regularly pay no advances at all. And bear in mind that it takes a long time to be paid as an author, you might spend years on a book and then it can be two years from acceptance of manuscripts until you receive your first royalty payment 
So there's a long starvation period in between um, that needs to somehow be thought of. And authors build a backlist and build an income over a lot of time. And PLR and ELR is an important part of that overall uh, picture, which I'm sure Kirsty will mention. Uh, there's also on today's authors increasing pressure to conduct their own marketing and promotional activities. Uh, social media has put a whole new um, pressure onto authors' time. And of course, that's time that they're not writing. Uh, we have seen last year the reduction of event income during COVID when festivals and schools and library appearances had to be cancelled. And we're also observing a drift to online shopping, which has certain implications for authors. For example, um, because of the way online shopping works with bestsellers being served up to you and being, um, you are promoted what you've already read, more of the same, big name brand authors are promoted. The discoverability for new unknown debut authors is very challenging. <clears throat> And then there's been supplementary sources of income that have been challenged. So universities during COVID shared a lot of casual teaching staff and freelance writing opportunities have been affected during the whole disruption to the traditional print media industry. I make all of those points to arrive at a central point, which is this, it's hard to earn a living as an author. It's harder than ever. And this is the main way that the government invests in Australian authors and illustrators. It's $22 million a year currently. Um, and it's not just any author. It's those authors whose books are sufficiently valuable that they've been purchased by libraries, that there's a minimum of 50 copies held by libraries. So it's supporting the, the canon. It's supporting our authors who are, are read and valued. And the infrastructure is there. It's all set up. The administration is there. So the ASA has been um, trying hard to persuade government that it's now time to expand the criteria so that we can move it forward for future generations of authors. And maybe I will stop there so that you can hear from an actual author <laughs> who can tell you about her experience. Thanks, Olivia. I think that's the really interesting, the, the point you make. I mean, the, the trend towards more and more in our lives being digital and online isn't new. It's been, you know, it's been going that way for some time, but COVID just sort of skyrocketed that trend, didn't it? And, you know, everything now. Um, uh, seems to be digital and online shopping, um, including going to the library and borrowing books, um, which brings us very nicely around to Kirsty Murray, who is a, an author. Um, uh, Kirsty, we'd be really interested to hear from your perspective about how the um, the current lending scheme, um, lending rights scheme, works, um, and what it would mean for you and, and authors, um, you know, if the scheme was extended to digital collections as well. Thanks, Ben. Well, uh, I'm going to be really brutally honest and tell things that most authors are embarrassed to admit how little they make uh, because it's a huge amount of work to produce a book and it's years and years in the making, but very few people make more than a few thousand dollars on that book. I'm really, I'm really lucky and I'm also really stubborn. I've been uh, working as a professional author for 23 years now. Uh, 1998, I published my first book, and I'm published by mostly by Allen and Unwin, who are one of the biggest commercial publishers in the country. So I've been really lucky uh, with having the support of a very serious publisher who's given me terrific distribution. I've published 23 books in those 23 years, and without lending rights, I would say probably half those books would never have been made because lending rights made it possible for me to focus on my writing. Starting out is really, really hard. You don't make very much in advances. It's harder than it ever was. 
because advances have shrunk and the real price of books has not increased, particularly in my branch of the industry, which is young adult and children's books. So my audience ranges from really little kids through to upper secondary and very adventurous adult readers who like to read YA and children's books. So those 23 books, some of them took, I was writing concurrently while I was working on other books, um, a book like this one, India Dark, came out in 2010 and it won the New South Wales Premier's History Award. Uh, the lending rights on that book are incredibly important to me because it's a book that that is a, a dense read. It's not a popular read in terms of being a, a runaway commercial bestseller, but it's solid. It's a solid book. And I'm really fortunate across my 11 novels that all of them are still in print. Uh, most of them have been studied at various times in schools. Uh, I've studied in tertiary institutions uh, as an author of YA and children's literature too. So that's like made it possible for me to give up all the six part-time jobs I used to have um, and, and make a living. But some years, like a year when you're writing a really big fat book like that, um, it's not possible to go attend festivals. It's not possible to visit schools and schools income is a really important part of my income. So uh, in, a, in a year where I'm really focusing on my writing, lending rights can make the difference between finishing a book or not. Um, so I receive $10,000 a year between 10 and 11 in lending rights. Uh, I didn't receive any lending rights till 2001. So I started publishing in 1998. Um, by 2001, I had four books out and they'd been in the libraries long enough that I started to be paid lending rights. And by 2010, when my big fat historical fiction book came out, uh, I was earning about $10,000 a year from lending rights. It was amazing. It meant that I could sit at the desk and research and write and produce this really big body of work. Uh, it was a backstop. And some years, embarrassingly, it was 50% of my income. You know, that $10,000 went a really long way. And then when the books were written, you could go out in the world, do school visits, do writers and residencies, apply for grants. An author's income is made up of so many parts, but lending rights was like this solid shining beacon in May where everybody in my wider circle of writers would go, hooray, oh, I can pay the electricity bill. It was so exciting. Like no one can really understand how exciting June is to an author. Um, unless they've received lending rights. But something really interesting started to happen about 2010 is my lending rights started to stabilise. Instead of having gone up right across the previous decade, decade, from 2010 right through to now, it was making very little difference. Educational lending, lending rights stayed solid and started to build. But even though I was putting out a book a year, my public lending rights were continually falling. And I thought, oh, my books are going out of style. Nobody wants to read them anymore. Why aren't they in libraries anymore? But then I checked the catalogue and they'd be in the catalogue. And I think that's mysterious. And the lending rights would come through. And yet still, it was static at around ten to $11,500 in that window, even with the new books coming out all the time, peddling as fast as you can, writing as fast as you can, talking about your books as much as you can. Um, just why is this happening? And I started to realize that my books were still really in library catalogs, but they were being moved into digital formats, particularly older titles. So a book that you've spent a lot of time producing and is still being loved and is still being borrowed and is still in libraries, no longer gives you any lending rights. Last night, I did a, a really quick survey just to check that I wasn't neurotic. And I looked at four of the libraries I use in my region, Yarra Plenty, uh, uh, Eastern Regional Libraries and, and two other libraries, Port Phillip. And they held, across six of my novels, they held 40 copies of those six novels. 29 of them were in digital format. Those 29 books that are in the libraries, and sometimes like there were several, one library had several e versions of this, um, I get no lending rights on those. And that means a huge loss to me. Probably in the next year or two, that book will pay no lending rights 
because the measure will have dropped under 50 across collections. At the moment, it's, it's a couple of hundred, but it's been dropping with every survey as it's been shifted into digital formats. So I think when you've worked as hard as, as I have for such a long time on your body of work to discover that it's still being enjoyed by the public, but you no longer receive any acknowledgement or compensation for the fact that people can read it, have access to it. Um, you're not really getting much on royalties on it either. I mean, for, if a ebook sells to a library, I receive a royalty on a book like this of about $2 in compensation for the 52 people who will read it, because that's what the license is. 52 people are allowed to read that book in a public library when it's in an ebook. So I think it's, we're just starting to see the, the decimation of lending rights to authors, particularly on the back of COVID, that it's gonna be a bigger loss. And it's going to mean that we're not going to have as many diverse writers because it's not gonna be viable to make a living, to give your time to a, to a body of work, to produce beautiful books. They take much longer than could ever be compensated for, for the value of, to culture. And it is a labor of love. Uh, nobody really gets super rich on writing. That's there. We hear about these people who make millions like JK Rowling, they're very, very rare. Most writers make low middle, com, middle class incomes and that income is getting lower and lower and is more demoralizing. And you get to the point now where I go into schools and very savvy teenage writers from who have really interesting stories to tell, say, well, you know, my mum wants me to be a doctor. She doesn't want me to be like you because I know how much you make. I think, well, you are really smart. Um, so we're not going to have a vibrant literary culture if we can't underpin it with some stability for our authors. Um, and I think the saddest thing too for really established authors authors older than me, people who are no longer producing, but have produced books we love, like major literary voices in this country, is that for a long time, lending rights was thought of as like a superannuation that would make it possible for you to actually live on these low incomes for a long time, but have some stability in your old age, because nobody pays authors supers, super funds, and they usually don't make enough to put a lot aside for it or anything. And so lending rights at one stage 10 years ago looked like it was this, this gift from the people to the writers of this country and the illustrators as well, that they would actually not you know, be homeless in their old age. And that's not going to be a thing. If everything winds up digital, the public are going to actually draw the benefit and they love, you know, people love their authors. I, I love what I do because I get fantastic feedback from my readers. But it's it's a demoralizing thing to have to admit how little you make and how you're making less and less and less from your work um, over time. And that the without a shift to digital lending rights, without some attention to this fantastic scheme that stabilized our literary community it's going to be very sad for all those authors who actually banked on the fact that they, that lending rights would provide them with a small piece of security as they age. So, you know, there's all sorts of disadvantages to not introducing digital lending rights. It disadvantages the young, it disadvantages our creative communities, and it disadvantages those older voices who have made such a fantastic contribution to Australian culture. So, yeah. That's my, my spiel on why we really need digital lending rights. Um, so, yeah, the estimate I reckon from looking across catalogues is up to anywhere between sort of 30 and 75%, depending on what sort of books you write, uh, your backlist will go into digital collections and you will not be compensated for them. So it's getting pressing. Yeah, thanks, Kirsty. I mean, but I'm you obviously make a really compelling case for um, for extending the, the lending rights scheme to a to digital works as well. Um, I wonder if we could, um, of course, inviting people to ask uh, their own questions, but I might jump in and, and steal a few um, while I can. Um, 
going into the the sort of the policy levers and getting a bit um, nerdy at that level for a second, if we can, um, what's stopping um, what's stopping uh, digital lending rights from being extended to to cover digital works? Um, and and sort of what are the the policy levers and policy mechanisms that that can be pulled to um, to extend that? Um, well, I just like to add before I even talk about the mechanisms, the twenty two million is not a, a very large slice of of the federal budget to go towards lending rights. Really, when you think of how much they spent on an ad for a milkshake, if they hadn't made the milkshake ad and they tossed that into lending rights, it would have made a huge difference to thousands of Australian authors. So, um, but I think Olivia, you're probably really well suited to talk to the conundrum of um, why we don't, why I the government's not jumping. I think it um, just hasn't been made a priority. Um, and because up until fairly recently, uh, it's probably true to say that ebook lending overall constituted a small part of library loans. And so there hasn't been the same urgency, and that urgency has arrived. Um, so particularly in light of the overall very low funding that goes to literature through Australia Council, for example, if you look at the entire government funding, literature does very poorly. Uh, so I think it's time, but it just hasn't been made a priority. I think there's also been some complexities and those complexities remain and those complexities will need to be worked through. There's an, not a one consistent license terms or model that is used by all publishers when publishers provide uh, ebooks to library aggregators. And that, is, that has made it difficult to say, right, this is the solution. So I think number one, complexities and variation across industry practices. Uh, and number two, just getting it to be a, enough of a priority for the legislation to be updated. Yeah, um, I just want to jump in and say I completely agree with Olivia. I think uh, one, there's just the, the need for a political um, impetus to really support Australian literature. There have been complexities because we've always done it on holdings. It's actually, we need a new model to do it because you can't just do a holdings of eBooks. And there have been huge complexities too in the way that eBooks are, are distributed through to libraries. And in fact, libraries are still facing incredible challenges with obtaining eBooks. There are some publishers and I know Amazon was in the news just recently worldwide for the fact that they will not supply to libraries at any cost in any format. So there are still some, there's a huge complexity about that ebook ecosystem. But what we've seen in other countries, for example, like Canada, who have probably one of the most comparable lending rights schemes to us, is those complexities are not terminal. And there are actually ways where we can now work and have a look at how we compensate um, the, the inclusion of electronic materials. And if we keep our mind very focused on the key fact that what we are trying to do is make sure that we get that payment through to those eligible Australian authors, then I don't think those complexities are going to be beyond us at the moment. Mm. Trish, you mentioned Canada there. Are there international examples then um, uh, of digital lending rights um, working elsewhere? Is Canada one of those places? Yeah, so one of the issues around looking at international examples is frankly, we've got the best lending rights scheme in the world pretty much. And a lot of the other lending rights schemes around the world have run into huge problems. Key ones being that they're copyright based, which makes them really difficult to administer. Um, and they don't manage to have, as ours does, the proper a really tight Australian focus. So you get very diluted and the majority of the money goes to best-selling international authors and more importantly international publishers and so you don't get that sort of domestic support that we're really looking for for our Australian authors and our Australian publishers. Um, so 
we've got a very different lending rate scheme from the majority. Canada is probably the most comparable. It's interesting to see that New Zealand is currently undergoing a review as well. And so it'll be really interesting to see where they end up shortly. Uh, and there should be some cross-Tasman lessons that we can pull on there. And the UK and Denmark have also expanded their PLR schemes to include digital formats. Yeah, right. Thanks for that. So we've got a couple of questions coming in um, in the chat. Uh, a few questions here. Uh, so one of them, uh, why is the royalty paid to authors for eBooks so low? Is it determined by publisher or aggregator? Um, and has the availability of secondhand copies online also impacted royalty, um, the royalty base for authors? Uh, uh, I'd like to answer that because when I said $2 uh, for a book that sells into a public library approximately, um, that is not a terrible royalty. Authors earn 10% or should earn, that's the industry standard, 10% of the resale price of a book, XGST. So that's about this, that's comparable with what you'd get for a print book. Um, the royalties are not different for the library. Uh, when a print book sells to a library, you get a regular um, royalty on that. So if the book retails for $20, you get $2 as the author. Um, after you've earned, after that's, you've uh, recouped your, your advance on that book. So it's a very long, slow, complicated process to earn money from books. But I think the real problem with the digital format is that a library might buy six copies of a print book to distribute across their region, but they'll only buy one copy of an ebook. And this is the problem with holdings because it's a, not a physical book that's moving around that you tend to find that there are lower numbers of that book in libraries. Uh, with a wider access and depending on the size of the library network too, you can have millions of people have access to that book um, in e-format. So yes, disappointingly, that's how little authors make on a book, 10% of the retail price of the book. Yeah, I, I like to say, I think one of the issues that we do have within the overall market is a, is a huge high rate of opacity. So from speaking from a library perspective, we know that we pay more per loan for a digital copy of a book. So libraries, if they have a copy of a digital book, it's, it's limited in some way. So often they will be single use so only one person can access that ebook at a time. And often that will only be for a set amount of time or for a set amount of loans. So you can actually almost calculate a price per loan. And the price that a library will pay to purchase a digital copy of a book is higher than it will for a physical copy. And if you work it out for the number of loans on a physical copy against the number of loans for a digital copy, libraries pay substantially more for electronic copies, which is an issue for library budgets, which is stretched at the best of time um, as they're spending an increasing amount on digital because we need to be able to provide those services. We're actually also therefore shrinking the amount that can be spent on physical. So that's that is a cons that high price for digital content uh, for less access is a real concern for the library sector. Uh, as I said, I think there's an issue, there is a huge issue around opacity. So it's quite difficult to know exactly. I can see it from a library perspective. Kirsty obviously can see it from an author perspective, but I think there would be lovely to have a little bit more clarity about exactly how these things are calculated. And um, Olivia might be able to even shed some light on how authors have these things reported back to them? Well, Trisha, I'd just like to say in terms of the, the price of the book, I think what gets left out of the conversation is the cost of the platforms too. So, of course, the library has to pay a lot more. Uh, my publisher, Alan and Unman, retail their um, e-books to libraries uh, at the same price as the print book, but uh, then there are the additional costs of it going through the the platforms like Overdrive and who distribute to the libraries. So there's so many players in it. It's not just like a physical book and that's part of the problem. But in terms of what both the publishers and the, and the authors are receiving and it's the model is so complex and there are so many different yeah. models from one publisher to the next too, mm -hmm. that we, yeah, it, it is for it. So. Yeah. Um, and the more players you have, the harder it is to actually get a clear picture of, 
what's happening, I think. Yeah, but I think the key thing is is what you said, Trish, is it's about um, supporting creators, which is the whole point of the scheme, Australian creators, and the terrific relationship we have with public libraries as well. And it's about access. So <laughs> the fact that the book costs more to the library is sort of not really relevant in terms of how lending rights schemes work because lending rights was never, I mean, a, a really big, fat, beautiful book that costs a couple yeah, hundred dollars. Absolutely. May and not one, be looked at as much as by as a short novel, but. And one of the nicest things about lending right, I think, is, is the fact that it's just such a recognition of that community value. And that is one of the most special things um, because as we all know, libraries love authors and authors love libraries and it's a, and I, it was one of those other things too, like that extra bits when Olivia was talking about the move to digital and so you suddenly get only the bestsellers that are turning up in, in your shopping trolley and all you're getting is that the lovely thing about the libraries is that they actively go out to make sure that they have that broad range of materials available and that it still is that organic browsing thing so you can go in and you can run your eye along the shelf with all of the different things and find the one that catches your attention or you can talk to your librarian and say I really liked these three completely unrelated books what do you think I should read next and because there's there's that extra serendipity sort of um notion around it that I think helps to break down some of that monopoly that we're seeing increasingly coming in with the shop books being sold in big W's and Kmart's of the world and increasingly pushed on when every time you do your checkout shopping. And I think it also goes back to one of those things you were saying before, Kirsty, about the long tail and almost the superannuation aspect of it. So, it, the, you know, the libraries know that it doesn't matter what's in fashion and the bestseller this year, there will be books that you wrote in 1998 that they know kids still want to read. And if they can have them in those collections, they will have them in their collection because they're still of so much value to the community. Thanks, Trish. Oh, I love librarians. <laughs> we love yes. you too. <laughs> Mutual love in society. <laughs> Um, another question uh, in the chat here. Um, I've heard that the lack of DLR is discouraging authors from depositing their ebooks according to e-deposit legislation. Is this true? And can the existence of e-deposit legislation be used as an impetus for the government? Well, I think that um, there is a distinction. Trish might want to expand on this more between the e-deposit collection and the borrowing collection. So I do not think that the existence of the e-deposit legislation is really relevant because libraries purchase books into their collection for borrowing, which is quite separate to the legal obligation on publishers and self-published authors to provide a copy for e-deposit. Is that, is that right, Trish? That is absolutely right, yeah. So the e-deposit legislation, that's, that's just making sure that legal deposit moved into electronic format. And so that is... And the whole purpose of having legal deposit was just to make sure that your major collecting institutions do have a copy of everything. And that's with their historical proper record of what's been published in the country. But yes, no, if you go and borrow a library, you go and check out your ebook um, from your local public library, it's, it has nothing to do with the e-deposit scheme. I think there's a lot of anxiety amongst authors about um, pirated works. I mean, one of my books in particular has been pirated so many times I just stopped looking anymore because there are so many free PDFs of it. It's a speculative fiction book called Vulture's Gate. And it was exhausting in its first few years how many letters my publisher had to send out saying, please take that down. That's a breach of our author's copyright. Uh, so there is an element of fear, I think, in the general community about um, e-resources and I do know of some authors and very successful established authors who just don't want to have e-versions e of their work because of the the damage that um, free pdfs do and and the potential for e-books in public libraries to be pirated but that's sort of aside from digital lending rights I mean digital lending rights 
is is a separate issue to the whole incredible mess of pirated copies of Australian creators' works. So it is, although I have to say it always makes me grumpy when people pirate books. And I'm like, you can go and borrow it in e version from your <laughs> library, tag <damn> it. Yeah. <laughs> But then again, when they borrow it, the author doesn't get any lending rights. So you know, that's <laughs> right. And when we get digital lending rights in, that becomes even more so. Yeah, it will be. It will be great. But yeah, it's a very wor- it's sped up a lot over COVID too. Um, yeah, that, that even more books have shifted into digital format, and I think the intention from the libraries is really great when they do that. But the um, the damage to to the authors is significant when their backlist turns into an e-resource. Yeah, and and while they are two very separate issues too, I will cheerfully admit that I think both lending right and e-deposit are quite obscure. And if you don't work in the area, you've probably never even heard about them and they're confusing. And I can absolutely see why if you didn't understand what NED, the National E-Deposit Scheme did, it would look scary. So I think potentially there's a bit of extra I, I know the libraries have done a lot of education and a lot of support, but I can understand why people might get the two confused or be worried. Mm, especially at a time like this, you know, as I think you've all mentioned with COVID and the you know growing impact on on the ability of authors to to carve out a living from from writing. Um, you know, there is that that real fear, isn't there, that just needs to be worked through with education and, you know, groups like Alia, I think, responded really well to that. Um, I wonder if maybe um, if the government was going to introduce uh, or extend the lending rights schemes to digital collections tomorrow, I wonder if maybe each of you could just give us a few of the really the key, the, sort of the most important points from each of your perspective that, um, that you'd like taken into, into account and consideration there. Well, the absolute first thing would be a boost to the PLR ELR budget. Um, <clears throat> it would be fantastic to see an extra $10 million for, <clears throat> for PLR and ELR once it's expanded to digital formats. As I mentioned before, government funding for writers for literature is very, very low. And so this would be an efficient way of investing in Australian authors. So bearing in mind that, of course, even if it were introduced tomorrow, it would take some time for that payment to flow through, surveys need to be done, et cetera. So I would like, um, I'd like to see a boost to the budget. Yeah, I'd like to see a boost to, to the budget for lending rights too. And a, and a deeper understanding of the impact that it has on the literary community and that when you have uh, a healthy literary community, a healthy cultural community, then you have a diverse and, and vibrant community. And when you chip away at the things that make it possible for people to live very simple, we're not talking about extravagant, we're not talking about disproportionate reward, we're talking about recognising that most of these people uh, are working for far less than the minimum wage to produce things that have, will give generations, like not just their own generation, but generations of Australians cultural benefit and enrich their lives. And one thing about lending rights, it stops when you die. It's not something that goes to your heirs. It's something that actually just keeps you ticking over and makes it possible for people to give the time to make more beautiful things for the people in the community. So it's very short-sighted when people start to talk about it as, oh, you know, they're getting enough here and how much they're making there. This is like an underpinning of a healthy cultural environment for every Australian and, and makes for young Australians, makes them look forward and think, well, I am interested in being a writer and there are support networks out there that value what I do. So it's also about acknowledging value um, and acknowledging the huge amount of unpaid work that Australians do. So yeah, an increase to the budget and uh, an understanding about access that when your work becomes freely available, you are losing the possibility of it being commercial. And most authors are really happy to see their work accessed because they it's a labor of love. Um, 
you know, you're pretty dumb if you think you're going into it to make millions. Um, so, oh, so access is important and, and, and a reciprocity about the value of that access would be really appreciated. Yeah, I, I have to completely agree. And I, I, I think an extra $10 million would be a good start for, um, and as it's one, as I said, it's one of the best, it is, I think, probably currently the best lending rights scheme we've got in the world. And if we can make sure that it actually covers the formats in which people are accessing that content, that's what will make it a really future-proof and useful lending rights scheme going forwards. It's, I find it quite interesting, like having lived through um, 10 years of um, the e-book is going to kill libraries, uh, computer games are going to kill books, children aren't going to want to read anymore, nobody cares, and none of it's come to pass, right? Like children still read books. We have 9 million public library users in the country. We have, you know, what, 160 million visits to li public libraries each year, 10,000 school libraries. Like libraries are vibrant. Children are reading. Book sales are still strong. And Australian content is still king. So they make up the top of the top 10 bestseller lists are Australia, the majority is Australian content last year. And the majority of the top 20 of loans in libraries was Australian content. So all the doom and gloom about how digital was going to wipe out literature and nobody was ever going to read again, all of it did not come to pass. So Excellent, except that what we haven't managed to do is move the infrastructure at the same time. So we're now running a fantastic, beautiful scheme. Libraries are vibrant, people are reading, kids still want to read Australian authors like Kirsty and everybody else that belongs to the Australian Society of Authors. Everybody still wants to read them, but the infrastructure is still back in like 1992. And so I think that's what we've really got to do is just push it into well, you know, 2021 would be a good start, as Olivia says, even if the money doesn't start flowing for another two years. <laughs> yeah, and, and looking at the, you know, a, a potential model then to adopt, is it is it still with a digital lending rights scheme? Uh, would, would payments then still be based on, on the number of titles held in the collection or is it a is it a per borrowing or per viewing um system that would work best i wonder if you have a um any thoughts around you know how the um how the surveying or, or you know how the accountability would work there well i'd be very sad to see it based on um on borrowings which is the overseas model because that basically benefit benefits the best sellers so it's more going to the top end and it disadvantages people writing literary fiction, writing niche fiction, um, writing poetry, because there's not many countries in the world where poets get lending rights. In Australia, poets can get lending rights. That, 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 that's unheard of. And they're not widely borrowed, but they're part of a really healthy uh, ecosystem uh, and a really healthy literary culture supports all types of writers. So I would hate to see it shift to being based on borrowings because and that we need to look at how the work is held and look at how the work has potential to be accessed so that so that the work is held in public libraries and those unusual readers who are looking for something very specific uh, that we will speak legions to them that the people who make those books are encouraged to make them because they will receive lending rights on them so it's hard to say exactly what the model will be until there's been more you know, commitment on the government's part and more work with the libraries, in my opinion. But um, something based on access would be really great for from the creative community's point of view. From the discussions that we've had with the Office for the Arts in their own interrogation and consideration of a digital lending rights scheme, they have um, indicated that it's most likely that the scheme would be based on holdings to mirror the print world. So the indication we have is that should um, the schemes be expanded, it's likely it will be based on holdings, unlike, for example, the UK, which bases their um, scheme on borrowings. So that, that's the 
that's the indication we've had. Yeah. And I think too, one of, there are two other issues on doing it with borrowing. One is that it's actually quite difficult to one, get the data and to compare the data in a way that would be in any way fair. Um, and the other one is that I, I think sort of dra maybe drawing from what Kirsty said, I, I don't necessarily love the conceptualization that one use equals one payment. I think that really discounts some of the wider benefit that you, that you get. And we know that people access things in physical and digital and various other ways in different formats. So for example, um, people who go into a library with small children are likely to read 20 books while they are actually in the library as the kids pick them off the shelf and put them back out. And it would never count as a borrow because they've just read it while they're on the premises. Whereas um, people who go in and take out, and so other times people will go in and take out five textbooks, which they're totally going to take home and use for their assignment. But actually it turns out they never actually open three of them, <laughs> for example. So <laughs> there's, there's a, I, I, I have some definite conceptual issues around doing it sort of as a per use concept. Fish has just described every textbook that I borrowed from my university <laughs> library. That was certainly my, my experience. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left, so I'd urge anyone um, to ask any more questions um, while there is still time. But one thing I would like to know is where the process is up to now. Is there um, a process underway? Trish and Olivia and the three of us recently spoke at a, um, a house arts um, a committee um, hearing to talk about um, the Australian arts and cultural sectors. Um, what's next? What's the next stage um, of the process? Well, wouldn't it be wonderful if the result of that inquiry into the creative and cultural um, industries and institutions included a recommendation for the expansion of the PLR ELR schemes? That would be uh, great. Um, what's next for us at the ASA is uh, we are going to try and put together some detailed case studies uh, on behalf for authors to try to just provide additional information to the government about this is how authors are being affected. So we just continue really to drive the campaign. And what's next for us is some case studies um, and then continuing to feed through information to the government to try and persuade them to push it up the priority list. And I'd just like to say from the, the library perspective, we are very, I mean, obviously we've been working really closely with the ASA and it's been fantastic on trying to do this, but we are definitely in the cheerleading seat. So we are on, on there to lend support for the ASA's next movements and very happy to sort of share our experiences because um, we very much can show that move to digital is happening within our libraries and that huge uptick during COVID. And so it's definitely something that is of interest um, and of concern to our broader library community. So we're very, very supportive and whatever we can do to support, we will be there. I can just see that um, someone has put a question in the chat saying, Olivia, you said average author income has gone down. Are there more working authors? Has that total author income gone up or down? It's actually really hard for us to know how many working authors there are in Australia. We don't, I know it's surprising, but we don't have that information. Um, we know that there has been an increase in the number of ISBNs um, that, or well, everyone here knows what an ISBN is. And that will also partly be driven by the huge growth in self publishing. Um, so I'm unable to answer what number there are of total working authors, um, but what the average author income is based on is just actually surveying and speaking to authors who, who self-describe as professional authors. If you were to include, um, for example, a lot of the self-published authors and indeed even 
traditionally published authors in the long tail. There are many, many, many authors who publish books and make no money from it whatsoever and supplement their income in other ways and really do writing on the side. We know that the tail is just longer and thinner than ever. Uh, we had an interesting statistic in our last year's government submission that there's actually, um, you know, I think it's about uh, one percent of of books published that sell more than a thousand copies in a year. So the tail of very poor sales is extremely long. Um, and we also know that the average author income, like back in the early 2000s, was sitting around $22,000. And then, as I said earlier, at 2015, it was down to $12,990. And we're hoping that another um, research, another survey, significant survey is coming. Um, and hopefully that will show where we're at now. I'd like to add about uh, author incomes too. I mean, I make, I'm really in a, in a small group of people who actually make a living wage from my work, but I'm always thinking three or four years ahead. And uh, one thing that I realized when lending rights were falling five years ago, I thought I've got to diversify my list. I'd written 11 novels year in, like working very long hours to produce a new novel nearly every year and realized that I needed actually to start go, to go back to writing more nonfiction because I could turn it over a little bit more quickly. And I've diversified into picture books. I do a lot more teaching than I used to do as well. Um, so you, and I, I do worry about the super thing at what point when I fall over and can't do this anymore. Um, so there are, it's, it's a very complex industry in, in the way people earn a living. And it's very mysterious to people how you can make a living from a book, but um, for the people who are asking things about royalties too, books keep on giving to their authors in various ways. And sometimes a book that you think that is forgotten can be picked up and sell a sub license and, and keep it alive. So writing books professionally is an act of faith that those books will find their readers and that they will find a market that doesn't necessarily pay you up front. You have, so it's why it's really important to have schemes that give authors space to create those books that will do those unexpected things at a future date. Um, so. and I, I've just noticed that Jenny's dropped a question in here too that sort of says where does e-audio fit into that and I think that sort of ties nicely from what Kirsty said is that that's suddenly a new market for some people's books too that has opened up is audio books and to make it very clear audio books currently do not come under digital or electronic or educational lending rights and the the ask from the authors and the libraries would be that that extension covers ebooks and audio books and there there are a number of reasons for that but amongst other things one of the key ones for us is accessibility so audio books are actually one of, are a more accessible format for an awful lot of people people with low literacy people with vision impairments so for us it is a really important category not both from an author perspective, but also from an equity perspective to have included. Yeah, thanks, Trish. And we've just gone over time, so we might have to wrap it up there. Um, but I just want to say thank you so much to Olivia, Trish and Kirsty for joining us today. Um, I think that was a really informative um, session and, and overview of the, um, the, the case for a digital lending right. I think you've you all very strongly made that that case, I am certainly convinced, and I'm sure that everyone else joining us here um, will be as well. So thank you so much for that. Um, for everyone else, um, our next session is on Tuesday at one o'clock, and that is uh, digitization in action, getting collections online. We'll be talking to the National Library, the Australian War Memorial, and IATSIS as well um, about how they've digitized their collections and some of the uh, the challenges and hurdles in, in getting those collections online and, and making them um, accessible and available to, to users, especially during um, over the last 12 months during the um, during the COVID pandemic. So thank you everyone for joining us and um, look forward to seeing you all at our next session. And thank you again to Trish, Olivia and Kirsty. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. <laughs> thank you. Bye.